Hello, everybody, and welcome again to Beyond Black and White, our, bubble, our Bible study about the history of literalism and thinking beyond literalism. Quick review, we're going to do some learning, unlearning, and empowering. And today, in particular, we're going to talk about maybe some of the ways that y'all felt empowered to narrativize, to add more to the story, add some dialogue in the creation encounter between Adam, Eve, God, and, um, and the snake. And I know at least one of y'all actually wrote from the perspective of the snake. So we'll talk a little bit about that and, and do some sharing. We maybe won't read all the narratives that we have because um, having received some of them, y'all really went into this thing and did some writing, which is amazing. Um, some of y'all, and but we can get little synopses of, of what was inspiring and interesting to you. So, a little review. Last week, we talked about two different approaches to understanding the creation story. We talked about the uh, historical grammatical interpretation which is sort of the more literalist approach to interpreting the Bible. And we talked about how there are these two different accounts, seemingly different accounts in Genesis, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, where we get different stories about how the creation of the universe, and in particular human beings, happened. In the first story, there is an account of God creating male and female in God's own image. In the Genesis 2, we get an account of God forming human beings out of earth and breathing into it, forming Adam and then taking a rib out of Adam and forming Eve. And so it's seemingly two different stories. And according to the historical grammatical interpretation, Genesis 2, the Adam and Eve story, is just an elaboration on Genesis 1. And so that's why we have the both accounts. In addition, according to this approach, uh, or many people who profess this approach, Genesis 2 is about the creation of sin, whereas Genesis 1 is about the creation of the universe. So there's this sense, there's a, there's a continuity between them. The historical critical interpretation, the kind of more liberal or progressive approach to interpreting the Bible, focuses in on a couple of different things. And one of those things is what we talked about, um, the documentary hypothesis. And this is the idea that the Hebrew scriptures in particular are actually composites of different sources. And so what accounts for the differences between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is that they were actually taken from different primary sources and edited together into the book of Genesis. And so the two main sources we talked about were the priestly source of Genesis 1. All they ordered steps kind of going one day to the next to the next. And then Genesis 2, the Yahwist source is what it's called. And it's called that because it's the place in the Bible where the word Yahweh, the name for God, shows up. And that gets translated as Lord because it is Yahweh in Hebrew is a four-letter word. Lord in English is a four-letter word. And so whenever we see the capital, all caps, L-O-R-D, it is an attempt to translate Yahweh. And so we'll see that again when we dive into the, the flood narrative. And we ended last time with an invitation to look at the story from Genesis 2 of Adam and Eve and the serpent. And we ended with looking at what God says to each of them, God's condemnation and punishment for each of those beings. Um, God goes into some pretty specific detail about why they are going to be punished and how they're going to be punished for eating the fruit and or for tricking um, human beings into eating the fruit. But we don't really hear a response from them. 
And so the invitation to y'all was, well, write one, write a response. And some of you did that. And so I'm gonna invite you now, maybe not to read the whole thing, unless you, you'd like to read an excerpt from it, um, but to just talk to us about what that experience was like or which character maybe you chose and, uh, and maybe what your response was to God. Anyone interested in sharing a little bit? I want to disrupt. I can't raise my hand. I can't find the baby boomer button on here, whatever. But uh, it's really, you asked the question, you said, what do you think of? And I went, you know, Snake, Apple, and those brothers. My God, you know, that was spooky to me when I was young. I, I wrapped my head around that stuff for a long time. But there's two things I want to share. There is, uh, in this lifetime, for some reason, the pandemic got me to to look at TikTok, there's two people. One's called God and Angel. You cannot believe the wicked humor of these two guys dressed in Ku Klux Klan coats. One of them's God, one of them's Angel. They are stone cold theater, and it's brilliant. And there's this other lady named uh, Ashley Otteson, and she does God, all the parts. She's every character, but there's this angel named Steve who is in charge of creating the animals, and it is hilarious. That's all I, got. I love thank you keith i love that knowing that people are taking this idea and running with it all over the place yeah love that thank you awesome. yeah <laughs> what you got julia sir but i am um, i actually had fun with it because you know you said just a second ago tony you said something about in the second narrative god created sin i don't know if you really meant to say it exactly like that but i was like yeah I mean, as the serpent, I kind of, I, I, I began my letter with what the hell Yahweh. I mean, um, it, it's this sense that it felt like entrapment, you know, it felt like you say, this is good and this is good and this is good. And you put all these good things together and, oh, wait a minute, you know, you, you, you created a trap. You put this beautiful, fresh, beautiful, tasty, sweet fruit out there and, then, you know, I, you didn't tell me shit. I just offered a piece of nice fruit to this lady. And the next <laughs> thing you know, I'm, you know, condemned and all this stuff. And, and so I really, uh, I felt like the serpent had certain, certainly permission to go, what the hell, you know, why did you, you did that. And, and really my last statement was, was, this is on you, you know, and, and so to take your words, Tony, of saying God created sin, I would complete it by saying, and the serpent would say, and then punished us for it. Mm. Yeah. I got a short comment, short comment uh, yeah. in this, in this story. To me, God would have made a terrible special ed teacher. <laughs> mm. Can you say more about what, what's led you to that conclusion, John? Oh, come on. <laughs> Isn't it obvious? <laughs> Just from the snake's point of view, poor thing. Yeah. I'm telling yeah. you. Yeah, okay. you know, that's that's interesting. Um, the, the, the question of the creation of sin, I just I'll back up to say that the um, the people who read the story literally and take that view would say that God did not create sin but that the serpent caused it. But I love Julia, you're, you're kind of saying, well, there, all this stuff is good. And so how, how am I getting wrapped up in this thing, getting blamed for the creation of, um, of sin in the world? Right. Yeah. And the serpent would say, how convenient, that, you know, oh, we're going to blame the serpent because we could have chosen not to do that. You know, it, it was enticing to do kind of thing. Sure. As a scapegoat, scape snake. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about other folks? Anyone else want to share a little bit about about what they wrote or from whose perspective? I have. Uh, I was Eve. Mm. So, um, so I am saying to God, if by this you mean by choosing to eat of the fruit, I have chosen to participate in this being human, I accept. I say yes to bringing forth life, yes to pain and bliss, yes to desire and aversion, yes to male, female, not as punishment, 
but as um, but to be able to experience myself. Mm -hmm. So it's a little more serious. Yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful, Diane. The sense of Eve not kind of railing against her punishment, but saying, if this is what it takes to be fully human, I accept. Yes. Yeah, wow. That's great. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else want to share a little bit? Yeah, Gretchen. You're muted, Gretchen. There. there I, had, I had trouble. I listened to this thing about an hour and a half ago. I finished listening to it. So I didn't write anything down, but all these things came to my mind and I had trouble being one person. You know, when you were asking us to, I mean, I just kept bouncing from the snake to the, to Eve, to Adam. And um, it was like, I, 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 I couldn't argue with any of them. It's like, I couldn't, it's like, I, like I understood all of them. Mm. I understood, I understood, I mean, it was like Eve, it was like Eve wanted to know, you know, she just wanted to experience something. She wanted life, you know, she wanted a part, that was a, and the tree was put in the Garden of Eden by God. You know, so in a way, in the tree is knowledge of good and evil. So you were talking earlier about good and evil, you know, but no, sorry, about bifurcating or dividing the world and and moral everything between good and bad, right and wrong, this or that. And I was just thinking how many. And the other thing I was thinking is all these people had choices. All these things with was a, the sin was born of choice and the and the will to know will to know mm -hmm. what will to know about life and everything. Yeah. You know, and to experience everything. And and so it seemed to me that it was like a really it, it put Jesus in a new perspective. <laughs> mm. Mm. Much kinder. I mean, a much, you know, I mean, it did kind of change things. Mm. Thank you for that, Gretchen. It sounds like you were feeling at least somewhat along the same lines as Diane, as it's all understandable what happened and played out. And if you remember in the story, when the <laughs> serpent tempts Eve into eating the fruit, Eve resists at first you know and she says well i'm told not to eat that i'll because god said i'll die and the serpent's like oh god won't kill you it's fine and he's like okay and then she she eats it and the first thing that happens right is that she and adam become aware of the fact for the very first time that they are naked that's the very first thing and that's in fact what clues god into knowing that they've eaten of the fruit um, because they feel shame. And, but again, that is too part of our human experience, isn't it? That, 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 that feeling of shame and what we do with it. Anyone else before we move on to talking about the flood? I wrote, I wrote about from Eve's perspective twice. And the first time I wrote it was, was similar to what Diane wrote. And I, I thought of that Eve as the, um, the grandmother of Mary, who says, "Let it be," um, and then and then I um, <laughs> then I talked to Carla, and I uh, and I wrote it again as Eve, the sister of Lilith, and there I lashed out at God, kind of the way that serpent did, and said, "You know, this is a setup," but also you made a big mistake. You put this. You, you thought you wanted companionship in the Garden of Eden. You wanted us to be walking with you in the evenings and communing with you. 
but you also didn't want us to know the difference between good and evil or the difference between right and wrong or the difference between beauty. And, and so you thought you could have companionship with somebody who was subject, subjugated this way, somebody, did you really want companionship or did you want adulation? If you just wanted us to adore you, you should have just left us as puppies. But when we ate of that fruit and now we, now we can see justice and injustice. Now we could be companions, um, but we, you know, you, you were mistaken to think that we could be companions if we didn't have this knowledge. Um, that's what I said to God as Eve. Yeah, that's a special ed thing right there, yeah. <laughs> what I thought of was the innocence. What I thought of was innocence, like, you know, when you're innocent, you don't, and the same thing somebody said about, you know, wouldn't make a spe good special ed teacher because these people were, they didn't know the difference. And so there was no good and evil. I mean, they were innocent. And so sex was good. All that stuff was good. It was, it was like not all divided up between this, this is right and this is wrong. And so then judgment started. And that's hard and that leads to the shame and all that other stuff. But anyway, yeah. it's it's interesting. And, and also pride, you know, like seven said deadly sins. It's like pride is a part of all of those people. Mm -hmm. You know, they're doing something, you know, that they were, they didn't trust God. No, <laughs> I think of all those things. Anyway, I'm just babbling. Okay, sorry. No, no, no. It's uh, that word innocence that is kind of floating around in our conversation that you just named, Gretchen, reminds me of there, one of the early church theologians. Uh, we talked about him a few weeks ago. His name is Irenaeus. He actually describes the story of Adam and Eve as um, Adam and Eve being children. And that they that part of what happens is he's he's not really looking so much for an account of why sin exists in the world, but more looking at this story as a description of a certain kind of development that happens in human beings. How we begin with this sense of innocence and exploration and a sense of sameness as we look at the world. But then as we age, that gets trained out of us or it falls away or what have you and then we start seeing the world in these rigid categories and so this is this story has been rich fodder certainly for us but throughout its history as a way to help us understand well, what makes being human hard and where does it come from maybe not literally but even just kind of figuratively so we're going to look today at the flood story as another account of what sin does in the world or has done or um, how certain realities can overwhelm us. So the flood story, what are the highlights? Can y'all, let's, Wait, let's sort of get- Can I just ask one question about what you just said? Sure. You said what makes being human hard. Are you saying that people who don't um, <clears throat> interpret the Bible literally might have just used this story as a metaphor to try to explain that? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. And just trying to get sort of a, um, to, to kind of build an account of how desire, for instance, affects our lives in ways, leads us in places that can be beautiful and exciting and invigorating, but also in places that can ultimately be damaging. Um, some of the early church theologians described the very first sin with this fancy Latin rooted word concupiscence, which basically is a fancy way of saying desire. That's what led to um, to the first sin and that leads to a whole story about sexual shame and, and all the rest but anyway yes that's right susan that and even if you read it literally it can be a story about how human beings fell from grace 
this is what happened and we're trying to redeem ourselves. Um, but yeah, it's sort of, it kind of, the way folks have read it, regardless of how literally they do so, it can be a story about um, how human beings evolved or became who we are. And and do all um, like other kind of world religions have these same stories to explain suffering? Because I guess what I'm thinking here is like, why do why do cultures why do we all think we should be happy? You know what I mean? It's like um, there. It seems like all cultures are looking for for some explanation of of why we're we're not happy or why bad things happen as if you know we should all be happy and peaceful and bad things shouldn't happen do you know what i'm saying i do yeah and i think there's a subtlety to to your question because you know is the goal happiness so that we right. never experience suffering i mean and there are certainly folks who would argue that um, particularly within the Christian tradition, that it's all about joy and following Jesus, believing in Jesus brings us joy and what have you. Another way to see it, though, is that actually what we're talking about is oneness, is about an experience of the world that is rooted in grace, which isn't the same as happiness, but is the same, as, but but is more about a sense of wholeness and fullness and knowing that um, terrible things will happen. Yeah. And in fact, that um, that's just part of the ebb and flow of what it means to be human. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, but the, you're right. There are in varieties of human cultures and religious and spiritual traditions, ways to try to identify why suffering happens and how to respond to it. So this is this is one one way to do that. That um, again, depending on your perspective, is either rooted in history or metaphor. Okay, that was very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So this flood, it just so happens that it's raining here in Memphis as we're talking about the flood. And I was telling folks earlier that on my way home from um, dropping off my family, I saw a rainbow, and it was so beautiful. I was just like. And so anyhow, rainbow is what we see at the end of this story, right? And the rainbow is an indication God gives to humanity, particularly Noah and his family, that God is going to never kill everybody again with a flood. And so how do we get there, though? How did we get to that moment? Can y'all help us build that out? What, how did this whole thing start off? Don't people like make God yeah. mad or something and then he gets real mad and just kills everyone? I mean, that's pretty much a, a, a one sentence synopsis of this whole thing. <laughs> that is correct. God looks at all the sin in the world and gets upset about that and then um, sees Noah and tells Noah to build an ark. And then what happens? There you go. And God decides that he's going to um, save the creatures of the earth by making sure that one male and one female of each of them <laughs> is, is, is preserved um, from the flood that God is about to uh, visit upon us all. And um, Noah builds his ark according to very specific instructions. And then um, it rains for 40 days and 40 nights and all the earth is covered in water and everything perishes except for those creatures on the ark. Um, then then when uh, the mountaintop appears as the floodwaters go down, um, the the, uh, the dove goes out and, and finds a, a, a sprig of something growing. I guess the plant matter didn't all get destroyed, only the the creatures and then um and then we get the promise from god that we won't get destroyed by floodwaters again <laughs> <laughs> <Higher> next time. <laughs> yeah. 
Julia said it might be a fire what next time. Fire, yeah. fire, or <laughs> I'm not in God's corner on that. Um, <laughs> my, my take yeah. on the story was that uh, of a, a child painting a picture and they're just mad at it and they're ripping it up and I'm starting over, you know, but I want these crayons because I created these <laughs> and they're good. Remember, I don't make mistakes. It's mm -hmm. just, I don't like this. Y'all are doing right. <laughs> Go to your room. <laughs> when, when I read the story, I thought Noah had a huge obsession with carpentry and he built this big boat and God covered his ass by bringing his floods. He looked like a maniac out there building this thing. But I got to share this story. You're not disrupted by him. I get kicked off of Zooms all the time. But it's a community story. And uh, we've got this golden 1950 old UCC puppet thing, like Muley stuff. It's magnificent. Somewhere in the church, purple and gold. I set it up, I get all the finger puppets out of the uh, global goods store, and I do the Noah story through the eyes of uh, uh, Heifer United, whatever they are, Heifer International, whatever. And I'm doing this little theater piece, three, four acts, whatever. And then the, 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 the congregation is just unbelievably responding to this, whatever. I'm just up there behind the thing doing this, doing the whole story. And I, it was beautiful for me, of course, to learn the story properly, whatever. And I get to the third act and they think it's over and they just stand up and start applauding. You know, I'm back there on a mic, you know, whatever. And I go, fourth act. And they just bust out laughing like you've never heard. That was the most golden moment in my life. It was so funny. Oh, Keith, I love that. Yeah, the um the those those finger puppets are pretty, pretty fantastic. This is it's just a story that comes to life fairly easily because. It's so vivid. All the different things that are happening, it's very easy to imagine, and people have imagined it in a whole variety of ways. Now the question then comes though, is this history? Did this actually happen? Do we read this story literally, or should we read it some other way? So I'm going to describe exactly how and why people would choose to read this story literally. So the first premise that we've, we've, we've talked about um, begins with reading the Bible as the inerrant word of God. And so if you accept that premise, then that means that any scientific evidence that may be contrary to what God's word says is incorrect or at least incomplete and so but what makes this flood story seem like it's actually something to be read as history part of it is not only is it actually written in the bible but it's referenced in other places in the bible too and so here's a passage from isaiah 54 for a brief moment God, this is God speaking. For a brief moment, I abandoned you, but with deep compassion, I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. To me, this is like the days of Noah, when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Here's a reference to the flood. Then, later on, in the Christian Testament, we have the first letter of Peter. After being made alive, Jesus went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ to has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So here we have, and there, there are other references in the Bible to this flood event. And so that has led people who 
would read the Bible literally to double down on the sense that this is actually an historical event, given the fact that it's referenced in other places too. And so, however, for much of even the, the move toward more fundamentalist and evangelical approaches to reading the Bible, as folks began to learn more and more about the Earth's history and geology and evolution, the idea that the flood literally happened, fewer and fewer people, again, even folks who read the Bible literally were willing to read this part of it literally because they they were starting to entertain the fact that maybe this is just metaphor for something else. Maybe it's an analogy to Christ and baptism. They were kind of going other places with it. However, in 1961, a book called The Genesis Flood, The Biblical Record and Its Scientific Implications was published. This book ends up being a watershed moment in kind of cultural history in the United States as it relates to the evangelical and fundamentalist movements. John C. Whitcomb and Henry Morris were both scientists and also both devout fundamentalist Christians. And they actually take a scientific approach to breaking down all of the earth science that was still holds true, depending on who you are today, and, um, and, and really start looking at the geological reasoning behind why they believe the flood actually took place. They appear at different geological association meetings. They present this book. And one account I read said that when it came to the question and answer portion, no one said anything because they were just dumbfounded. They, and, and so this book is universally dismissed by the scientific community. However, it is wildly successful in the fundamentalist evangelical world, and it spawns whole new fields of research and new institutes and museums. One of those is called the Institute for Creation Research in Dallas. And this is a picture of a presentation that the, uh, from their website, where essentially what they're doing is looking at evolution and trying to upend the idea that dinosaurs lived millions of years before human beings. And so they make the argument that dinosaurs and humans lived at the same time. And they talk about, there's a passage in Job where there's a reference to a creature called a, a behemoth. And they make the argument that that is a reference to dinosaurs. And so they have a lot of, they cast a lot of doubt about carbon dating and other scientific methods to uh, date the earth and ultimately make the argument that um, you can actually use science to prove that the earth is a few thousand years old and that again, dinosaurs and human beings lived at the same time. This book is still, in fact, very popular in evangelical fundamentalist um, circles. It has had like 29 reprints. It's sold hundreds of thousands of copies. If you look on Amazon, it has a 4.7 rating with over 500 reviews. It's still making a difference in a really big way. I wonder what the guy with the mic is making a year. <laughs> well, I did see that the Institute for Creation Research is hiring Keith. So <laughs> if you if you would like a you know a third act, uh, you can move on down to Dallas. Let's talk a little bit about um, other ways of seeing this. And hold on, let me see what's happening next here. Okay, other ways of looking at this story that aren't rooted in literalism. One approach is a kind of a comparative mythological approach because there are several stories from ancient civilizations 
about giant floods that wipe out humanity. And there's actually in the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the first narratives that human beings have discovered that other human beings wrote, there is a story about the gods choosing to destroy the entire universe or destroy the entire earth with a flood. And they do so in this story because human beings are too noisy. And so they decide they just want to wipe them all away. But they choose a person, one human being who will survive, who builds a vessel to carry those who will be redeemed and survive away. And there are some folks who theorize that the word in Sumerian, or the name for this person in Sumerian, if you kind of do some work of creating like contractions of that name, you can, after enough time, get to the name Noah. That would be sort of um, an Arabic or a Semitic language version of this Sumerian name. And so, again, it's the idea is that this isn't history, this is mythology, and it's actually an ancient mythology that pops up in various places around the world, but particularly in this region. So then maybe it refers to maybe a flood that didn't necessarily wipe out all of humanity, but maybe there was a catastrophic flood that took place, and that's being referenced. Or it is a metaphor. And you've got folks from the psychoanalytic tradition who will say that given the prevalence of flood dreams that human beings have, maybe there's some sort of collective unconscious that floods signify something is an overwhelming experience in our waking lives. So there's that. Then, in addition, there's the documentary hypothesis comes back up. As we were just talking about the priestly source and then the Yahwist source as it pertains to the creation story, well, folks take that same approach to understanding this story because there are inconsistencies. So there's um, the University of Pennsylvania, I think it's their Judaic Studies Department, has kind of created um, a side by side look at these two different accounts. Are y'all seeing that? Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so this is a look at the flood story trying to track where the Yahwist account and the priestly account differ. So just taking the first paragraph in each. In the Yahwist account, here we see that word Lord again, right? The all caps as a way of translating Yahweh. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out from the earth the human beings I have created, people together with animals and creeping things and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the sight of the Lord. That's the Yahwist account. Uh, and it says J there because um, instead of a Y, sometimes for, for the Y sound, J appears. God plans the flood according to the priestly account. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw that the earth was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted its ways upon the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. Now I am going to destroy them along with the earth. Make yourself an ark. Okay, so again, here in this priestly account, we have references to God, but it's just God, it's not Yahweh, right? And it's sort of, it, it feels like a reiteration of what we read the first time. If you notice, the priestly account comes in uh, um, chapter six, uh, verses 11 through 16, 
the Yahwist account is chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. And so they come really close to one another. You, there's several other moments in which it feels like it's either redundant or where there are some differences. So in Genesis 16, 19 through 22, God says, And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Then in chapter 7, verses 2 through 5, God says, Take with you seven pairs of all clean animals, the male and its mate, and a pair of the animals that are not clean, the male and its mate, and seven pairs of the bird. So we have a difference here. In the first one, God says, Just bring everything, a pair. And then in the other version, we have seven pairs of all the clean animals, but then only one pair of the animals that aren't clean. So, and it goes on, even the duration of the flood. Was it 40 days, as it says, um, or actually how long it rained is, is another question. But then for the duration of the flood itself, was it 40 days or was it 150 days? These are what you might describe as inconsistencies that support this documentary hypothesis. So a question might be, well, how do you reconcile that if you don't take a literalist or if you do take a literalist approach? Well, one of the ways is by, it's a, sort of the same logic that applied to the creation story, which is that these different moments that we see are just elaborations, or they are in fact kind of poetic ways of rehearsing certain details that appear in other ancient literatures too, where there is, um, the technical term for this is chiasmus, and it's a literary device where things get paired. So it might look like A, B, C, D, C, B, A, so that there's sort of parallelism. And so there are these elaborate accounts of this that you can find just by doing a search of it. And um, where they track, where it says 40 days in the beginning and then 40 days at the end where then there's 150 days where something happens, then 150 days at the end. And so there's this attempt to reconcile all this by saying it literally happened, but the way it happened, all of those details, there's some poetry in there about it. Okay, so we've got these two approaches. Yeah, yeah, Joanne. You're muted, Joanne. That's okay. There. There, we go. there we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, Tony, the um, the first thing that you showed uh, had quotation marks of, around what God said. Mm -hmm. uh, this was back in Genesis, of course. I, I, who wrote that and who heard God and quoted him, and how can that be? Uh, who I, I'm interested in who they attribute Genesis uh, to, yeah, the author, and yeah. um, the the different um, the different interpretations uh, on this one item. Genesis uh, being believed literally by some people, a lot of people, let's say, and um, other people that are trying to deal with current matters, at, but still glean guidance from the Bible. Yeah, That's what seems to me to be such a difficult task. And we only have X amount of time, mm -hmm. uh, speaking for myself. And uh, it, it's just, um, 
I, I am very interested in who actually wrote the words and in the quotation marks around God speaking. And that that's a small uh, item, but it's very important to me if God actually said. And But to be honest, <clears throat> 2,000 years ago, uh, is kind of a running commentary until um, Pentecost. And then we've been relying on the Holy Spirit. And as far as I know, uh, no words have been recorded uh, by the Holy Spirit. I mean, there have been some channeling and all that type of thing, but I I'm talking about trying to adjust humans and teach humans, to teach children. You know, children love the story of the ark and mm -hmm. um, they carry that with them all their lives because it's such an interesting story. Absolutely. But, yeah. but yes, but, uh, but I just wonder what your take is on the authors of this material that we're reviewing. Yeah, it's a great question, Joanne. And uh, according to tradition, Moses is the answer. This is one of the first five books of Moses. However, um, what the, the scholarly community tends to think is that the texts weren't actually written down and recorded, that these were just oral traditions that existed um, up until around the fifth century BCE. And maybe even as late, then maybe they weren't actually recorded until the third century BCE. And that was a, as a result of a variety of reforms that were happening in the, uh, the kingdom of, of Judea um, and an attempt to kind of consolidate Israelite history and culture. And so, but there's, there's, there's not really clarity around what people did that um, but the idea is that it was around somewhere in that 200 year span that the hebrew scriptures as we have them today were consolidated edited put together the question of quotation marks actually is an interesting one because whether you're talking about the hebrew scriptures or the christian scriptures Quotation marks, capitalization, these are conventions of English and the separation even of chapters and verses and all of that. These are things that were added in. And so it's based on uh, tradition to a certain extent, whether it's religious tradition or even academic tradition as to how these things get separated out and different translations do it differently what the chapter and verses uh, separations are, that all depends on which version of uh, the English translation you're reading because they do it in different ways. So there's, there's a lot of uncertainty around questions of authorship and dating and all of that, which makes it, I think, in some ways harder to, to argue that this is literal history. One of my thoughts was when we started, you said you were going to empower me. I'm going, oh, what percentage of the three is that going to be? But what you're saying today and just the capitalization of Lord tripping me off to Yahweh, uh, you know, quotations or, you know, when people select that version, the Yahweh's version, that's very empowering. And what you just said, too, was very empowering about uh, reading the literature and, and the possibilities of what could be going on. And lastly, you know, if you were in the field of Real Foot Lake when the friggin' Mississippi River went backwards, you'd be looking for a boat. You know, this is a powerful, <laughs> creative planet. I mean, it did happen. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Absolutely. Well, you know, I'm glad you brought up the issue of empowerment, Keith, because, you know, really what that issue hinges on is our sense of what scripture is for. We've been talking. Even both of these two approaches, whether we're reading the Genesis story of the flood as literal history or as um, a composite story or an echo of a mythological um, antecedents or however we talk about it. In, in either case, we're talking about scripture as 
something that helps us look into the past, something that helps us understand either what happened or how God functions or the history of our faith. And that is one, one thing that scripture can do. However, what about how it applies to our day now? How might scripture be a way for us to understand, interpret, process realities that we're enduring right now? And so I'm going to show you all a couple of ways that people have done this with this story in particular. And so one of those ways <clears throat> is in architecture. So let's see. This is a big old church in France. And if you notice the ceiling, it has this kind of vaulted character to it. And so in church architecture, this part of the cathedral or church is called the nave. And that is a reference to a ship. So the idea is that the church is an ark in and of itself, taking us into salvation. And so there's this way of using the story of Noah and the flood to mm -hmm. actually connect with the very foundation and function of our faith in one way or another, is meant to save us from a flood. Another way that folks have used the story, this is sort of a, a, a figurative, creative way of using this story to shape uh, a kind of a present experience of faith. Outside even the realm of faith, here's a picture of Greenpeace activists who mm -hmm. built a model of Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, which is where, according to Genesis, Noah's Ark finally lands um, and as the flood waters recede. And so here are these folks who build um, a, a replica of Noah's Ark, not for the purpose of kind of making any real religious claim, but as a way to break through the noise of people's everyday lives and say, we are at a crisis point and pay attention. Look, we, the flooding is happening at epic proportions because of climate change. And so this was, this was actually, um, these are activists who built this replica in Turkey, in modern day Turkey, on Mount Ararat. Lastly, I want to show y'all this really, I think, interesting, powerful poem that um, is, is not just a poem, but actually is doing a couple of different things. So I'm going to show you this poem called The Sow Speaks to Noah by Diamond Ford. All right, are y'all seeing that? Mm -hmm. Let me see. Now, can you hear this? No, not yet. All right, let's see. Hello. Can you hear this that? This is Diamond Ford reading my poem, The Sow Speaks to Noah. And what should I think of this? Mercy in a near month languishing on a boat gone nowhere, the tusk and musk of livestock, gassy camels, chickens that flick wet flecks of shit, giraffes, and they long necks forever knocking somebody flat on the asses, never mind the sheep bleating all night, and then somebody stay watching me piss, eat, or sleep, reminding me that I'm the voice of a generation, as if that should make me humble. As if that might make me forget that the only sky you've given me is a puddle snagged on the sharp edge of candlelight. It can't be a journey that takes you from home and never gives you back. Is it a gift that I've survived to send my kids to slaughter? Better home is the mouth of their mother. Yes, 
I will eat my children before I let their buttocks butter into fat back better to bore, gore through the next soft meat and seed my children chestnuts rendered free. Their spirits you can't digest, and this ain't the last flood, Noah. Your generations drown my kin in white noise daily. But did you know a pig can swim for miles if it gotta? And I breed often, turn my whole ass out to open ocean, kick a tremolo of waves behind. My whole brood finna wash this planet. Maidens of mud. When the water done making slop of the earth will root in raw dung, kick wherever our pink hooves please, outnumber the men who penned us here, feed to our bellies bulge into boulders, be too large for any hook to hold us. Wow. She did better than you with the snake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just a couple initial reactions um yes we all heard that marcia <laughs> uh and no offense julia but she is correct this so what are y'all's takes on this what are you what are you hearing what sticks out to you what strikes you what strikes me tony is the fact there's a common theme uh, riding through all of this. God makes this, but he messes up. So he punishes. Then God does it this way. Oh, sorry, that didn't work out either. So he wipes out the world. Mm -hmm. now, what are we to think of that? Continue, <laughs> continue, <laughs> continuing. I mean, it's just, uh, to me, the sow is speaking <laughs> to that. As far as I can see, anyway, and uh, that's one thing. One thing my older brothers always had problems with is, if God's God and He created everything, it was good. It was good. It was good. Why did He create sin? How did He create sin? What now? How How did He create sin? If He's all good, how could sin come? Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I think it's I think part of what we're reckoning with here is trying to apply logic to a set of texts that aren't meant to be logical. They're meant to expand our imaginations. They're meant to give us ways of finding meaning. They're meant to help open our experience of the world up and maybe offer some possible uh, explanations for how human beings were put together in the way that were put together. But one of the things that we saw when we were tracing the story of how the scriptures became canonized is that they were always speaking to the current events of the people who are putting them together. And in this case, what Diamond Ford is doing I'm just going to point out a couple of things. One is the form of this poem. Do you notice these little numbers next to the line breaks? She's attempting to gesture toward scripture. We have chapter two. It can't be a journey that takes you from home and never gives you back. Then verse two of chapter two. Is it a gift that I've survived to send my kids to slaughter? Better home is the mouth of their mother. And so we have this black woman writing about these pigs who are being carried as an act of mercy. Do you see mercy is capitalized to this place ultimately so that they can be eaten. And what she's doing here is not only talking about the sow and the story of Noah, she's also talking about slave ships. Mercy was the name of a slave ship. Uh, it was, there, there are stories of enslaved women who choose to kill their children rather than have them be enslaved. And, and so she's, she's using the story of Noah and the format of scripture 
to elaborate all different kinds of realities that maybe she's gesturing toward um, the transatlantic slave trade. Maybe she's talking about um, the reality of oppressed peoples and how certain kinds of salvation are in fact uh, another form of oppression. Maybe she's gesturing toward a whole variety of realities, but she's using this story as a way to talk about feelings, realities, histories, experiences that she is deeply enmeshed in. And so, you know, I offer these, these last few ways of thinking about this story, not to say that any one of them is correct, necessarily, but as examples of how people have used these ancient scriptures, not to just try to derive knowledge about how history worked or what happened thousands of years ago, but in fact, how they've used scripture to illuminate and expand and deepen their experience of the reality they are living. And so what I wanna invite y'all to do in preparation for the next time we get together is write an updated version of this story. The invitation is, in the Noah story, the world is overwhelmed and destroyed by water. So if you were going to write an updated version of this story that in some way spoke to either your own life experience or current events or what have you, what would it be that overwhelms the world? Debt, guns, extremism. So the, think about what, what symbol, what reality, what overwhelming force you might write about or think about as the thing that destroys humanity. And just take some time, you know, again, if you can write it, you can write it if you'd like, you can draw it, you can just think about it. What might be the force that overwhelms and destroys the world today? Any questions about that? Okay. Well, y'all, I just want to thank you again for your questions, your thoughts, your willingness to dive into um, these stories and the ways people have used them. And the next time we get together, we will kind of talk some more about the flood and then we'll kind of make our way again, following this same format, looking at different ways to interpret a story and then looking at different ways people have let it empower their own lives. So thank you again, and I look forward to seeing you all next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Tony.